Roger Bootle, the chairman of Capital Economics. He founded Capital Economics in 1999, and it is uh, one of the leading economic research companies in the world. And having trawled the internet, I fi find that people think it's worth around £100 million. Um, so, Roger, we're very grateful uh, to you for coming here today and taking time out from your very onerous responsibilities. Uh, in 2012, Roger and his team won the Wolfson Prize, the second biggest prize in economics after the Nobel. Roger's books include Money for Nothing and The Trouble with Europe. During the referendum, Roger played a key part in, in the Economists for Brexit campaign, and his weekly column in the Daily Telegraph provides an oasis of economic sanity. And if you missed his column last Monday, this is what he had to say about the level of individual taxes. Almost without exception, the appropriate answer to this issue is quite simple, lower. And on the question as to whether the Chancellor should wait until to November to introduce stimulus measures, Roger's answer was, it would be too late to provide a boost when it is most needed, namely in the first half of next year. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Roger Bootle. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be asked to speak to you today. Uh, I must, I'm afraid, begin with something of an apology because uh, my eyesight isn't that good and I hope I can read my notes. Still, since I'm supposed to remember John of Gaunt, I suppose I'm entitled to have dodgy eyesight. Um, now, uh, this, is, this gathering has got a bit of the air of triumph about it and I think justifiably so. Uh, we've won. Um, However, like many a battle, it's not yet all over. And it seems to me that um, on the economic front, maybe on some others as well, we face ahead of us two very different sorts of demons. The first is the EU, and the second is ourselves. And I want to say something about that. Um, I'll touch on, if I may, the key economic issues as I see them, that's to say trade, regulation and tax. I'm sure all of us are going to say similar things, I think, about this, and so forgive me if I'm repeating or pre-repeating what people are saying. Um, trade, regulation and tax. And there's also something else, something much more nebulous, which in deference to our friends across the channel, I'll call a certain je ne sais quoi. Now, first of all, um, on trade, I don't think we should be under any illusions. We've seen the EU's negotiating position. They're demanding all sorts of absurd concessions, uh, including regulatory alignment and heaven knows what else, what else, in order to gain so-called access to the single market. I wish someone would explain to me fully what this word access means. I understand that you know there can be tariffs, I understand there can be quotas, I understand there can be checks, but when people talk about access, uh, you sort of imagine a brick wall, you know, with someone like Barnier standing there saying, no, you can't come in, old boy, you can't have access. And of course this is total and complete nonsense. I'm quite clear that we should make no such concessions whatsoever uh, to the EU on this trade issue. And um, I, for one, would be quite happy to be treated by the EU as just some other uh, country with which it trades. And I'll say a bit more about uh, the trade that other countries do with the EU in a moment. Uh, during the um, last couple of years, there's much has been made of, uh, of having an arrangement that's been dis described as Canada Plus, or Canada Plus, Plus, Plus. And it seems very much as though the EU wants to give us something like Canada minus, 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 <laughs> minus. <laughs> um, now, 
some people are quite optimistic that a deal can be done. Um, and I think, well, I mean, no doubt, actually, that in principle it could be done, despite this very tight time scale. Um, and it, something may, may emerge, and as been said earlier on, Boris, after all, has played a blinder so far. He did pull off that uh, change that no one thought he was going to be able to do. Um, but I wouldn't entirely rule it out. But I must caution you, I think it would be wise not to expect a deal and to prepare uh, for the EU to be extremely difficult and we must therefore make our plans, I think, to walk away, if necessary, without a deal. <laughs> On our side of the argument, I think there have been a lot of people who've, dare I say it, overemphasised the economic costs to the EU of not doing a deal uh, with us. Uh, they're, they're right, there are those very substantial costs. Um, and the general assumption has been, I suppose, that the EU is a rational being <laughs> dominated by considerations of economic rationality. Uh, and it's not. I mean, to Oscar Wilde would say something about that, I'm sure, if he observed the EU. Uh, the evidence is plain before you. And as well, if you are an EU bureaucrat, which I hope you can uh, understand I'm not, uh, <laughs> I can understand why they might think in the way that I think they're going to think. That's to say, the primary objective, I suspect, is going to make sure that Britain does not get yes. away with a very good deal. Because what they are worried about is that this then makes it clear to other potential leavers that you can leave the EU, you can get pretty good terms, and then there's the UK doing stonkingly well afterwards, then what then happens to the EU? Um, and I think you can probably all guess the answer. So I rather suspect that they're going to attempt to do a sort of exchange between fish and financial services. Um, well, how can I put it? It stinks. Uh, <laughs> Um, fish uh, are much more important, it seems to me, in this negotiation than is indicated by sheer account of the importance of fisheries industry in GDP, which isn't that great. Very, very symbolically important because, of course, Ted Heath sold out the fishing industry at uh, the last minute to get the, uh, the agreement that took us into the EU in 1973. And... Um, the fishing industry is concentrated in some strategically very important places, including, of course, in Scotland. So if we were to concede on the position of uh, the fishing industry allowing free access to continental fleets, I think it would be seen as a major, major defeat. Moreover, I don't think the city of the financial services industry in general needs the EU. The EU needs us much more than we need it. Um, now, I'm not going to suggest that, you know, it's best... Uh, uh, for us to end all this without having uh, being able to have access to the EU financial services market. I would much rather that we got some sort of generous deal on that issue, uh, but I'm not pessimistic about the city's ability to withstand the situation if they insist on a pretty grim situation. And after all, thinking about the future, wh wh what is going to be the dynamic part of the world, the EU or the rest of the world? Now often, I think we know the answer, often the is talked about solely in terms of goods, but it also applies to financial and business services. There's going to be a massive and growing market for the city's expertise outside the EU. Now, coming back again to this word um, access and the spectre that's laid before us as being treated as some sort of outsider and excluded, and the media, particularly the BBC, seems to swallow all this, and yet there's so much evidence that can be gleaned and adduced as to what life outside the EU would be like. Look at those countries that are outside the EU and don't have trade agreements with the EU. Look at their performance. And a chap called Michael Burridge has done some splendid work on all this, um, going back ages and totting up the rates of increase of exports from a whole series of countries around the world and comparing them with the rates of increase of exports of countries within the single market. And would you believe it? The rate of increase of exports from this group of countries outside the EU into the members of the single market is greater than the rate of increase of exports of single market members to each other. Yeah. So 
what exactly is it to be excluded? What is this access thing again? You know, what have we got to fear? Um, it seems to me that we've got every reason to be strong in these negotiations, and I say to walk away if necessary. There's also, I think, a very um, important point about other trade deals. Um, they're often exaggerated, I think, in importance, but uh, it is going to be very helpful for us to have good trade deals with other countries, and far and away the most important of those is with the United States. Um, I hope that we can conclude such a deal uh, reasonably quickly, because um, the consequence of concluding a deal with the United States is to put downward pressure on the prices of a whole series of goods in this country with which EU producers compete. Uh, and I think this will be a very important factor in softening whatever blow comes from our so-called exclusion from the European market. Uh, now let me say something about um, regulation. I mean, trade's going to be important, and Patrick may say something today about quantifying how important. He's done a lot of wonderful work on, on this, as has, as has Tim. But my suspicion is that um, more important than freeing us up from EU protectionist trade policy is going to be what we do on regulation. And this is why, to my mind, it is just completely unacceptable to think in terms of uh, conceding a so-called level playing field with the EU and accepting EU regulations, either current ones or ones that are coming along in the future. And it's difficult, I think it's very difficult to pin the cost of regulation down, as both Tim and um, Patrick have made sterling attempts to do so. But there are so many bits of evidence to suggest that the costs of e excessive EU regulations, unsuitable EU regulations in this country are massive. To name just a few, there's the Working Time Directive, which is a piece of absurdity. Why on earth should people be limited uh, with regard to the number of hours that they should work? The Clinical Trials Directive which has seen Britain lose its leading place with regard to the testing and invention of new drug treatments. And then there's the precautionary principle in general, as it affects a whole load of things, but including, in particular, agricultural production. This sort of thing goes right through our uh, whole country and society, and we will do extremely well to be shot of the whole approach and evolve a regulatory system that's appropriate to ourselves. Tax. Now, this is a difficult one because, of course, I, I don't know, I guess most people in this audience of natural supporters of the Conservative Party uh, and probably in favour of low taxes. We have to accept that we've had a lot of support, obviously, from people from the Labour Party, from a Labour Party background. They don't necessarily agree with the traditional Thatcherite approach to tax. I think this is, this is a problem for us. But in my own mind, I've got a pretty clear idea about what's to, what has to happen to the tax system. And the reason is that it's not going to be, as Bill said, it's not going to be plain sailing outside the EU. There are going to be a, a series of industries, particularly if we don't get a deal, which are, I think, going to be quite badly hit. And the motor industry, we know, is in trouble anyway. There will be different difficult times ahead, and lots of big businesses will be making decisions about uh, what to do with their investment and where to locate their staff and so on and so forth. And I think it's extremely important that we send out a message to the economy, to the British people and to all those businesses that this is going to be a super competitive economy. A high tax country, not as high as France, admittedly, but we become a high tax country. And this is pretty crazy. Uh, in order to be fully competitive in the world, we need to reverse that trend and get taxes substantially lower. And I don't just mean some of the um, so-called small taxes like stamp duty, which is an absurdity at the top end, but I think actually income tax itself must be lower. We operate a system now, as you know, where including national insurance, the standard rate of tax for people on modest incomes amounts to 33%. A third of their income mm. goes to the government. Uh, this is absurd. And the top uh, rate of tax of 47%, nearly half, again including national insurance, and various points in between where the marginal rate goes up to 60, or in some cases, some peculiar cases, even 100. This is daft. Now, um, a lot of people say, well, changes to income tax don't have much impact on productivity or on effort or whatever. I think this is profoundly wrong. They don't have an impact in the short term. No, they don't. People don't change what they're doing or up sticks and go and live somewhere else at the drop of a hat on the basis of what's happened to the tax system, the tax rate. But over the medium and long term, they have a huge impact. 
We all of us in this room, even if we can't remember John of Gaunt, I'm sure <laughs> we remember the brain drain and this period of many decades when anyone who was any good at anything, whether it was pop music, um, surgery, academics, anything, they were tempted by the prospect of leaving this country and going somewhere <laughs> else in order, unsurprisingly, uh, to maximise their income. And we must not allow that to happen again. In my view, we must make it clear that people who have talent, who work hard, can live and make their life and their, run their businesses in this country and keep overwhelmingly the lion's share of what they earn for themselves. This is, I think, extremely important. In that regard, I'm a bit worried, I have to say, although I'm pretty optimistic about this government, I'm a bit worried about this government on this particular issue. Um, so far, we've seen uh, a very strong inclination to spend money. Uh, I happen to think, with some notable exceptions, uh, there are arguments in favour, and I support increases in public investment, with the one exception of HS2. Uh, that's another story we'll leave one side. Um, but what worries me is that unless the government firmly sets out its plans for the tax system, and I would want to see it actually announced, much as the way the, the Thatcher government announced a medium-term financial uh, strategy, I want to see the government set out a strategy for getting taxes lower. But unless it does this, what I worry about is that, as since time immemorial, the Chancellor will just squander money on a whole series of things, and then, hey presto, there simply won't be enough money left for tax cuts, which, as I say, I think um, are extremely important. So I've covered the three things I said I would, and then I come to the je ne sais quoi. What do I mean? Um, what I, I mean is that I think during our time in the European Union, we've been restricted not just by regulations or protectionist trade policy, uh, not regard to tax, actually, they didn't restrict us very much, VAT. They didn't restrict us on corporation tax or income tax, although doubtless that's coming down the track. Um, the fourth thing that I think restricted us was an attitude of mind, a sense that Europe just wouldn't allow it. Um, and this was revealed actually the financial crisis when Mervyn King, now Lord King, was contemplating some action. I think it was a direct injection of money or perhaps it was a behind the scenes sort of knocking heads together and making sure you got a solution. And he was recorded afterwards as saying, well we couldn't do that because Europe wouldn't allow it. Now, in the end, it was proved that that wasn't true, actually. And can you imagine the French uh, failing to uh, sort out their financial system because Europe wouldn't allow it? I'm sure they would just have overridden it. But what got into Mervyn King's head, the governor of the Bank of England, was a sense of caution and hesitancy out of what would happen uh, in Brussels. And I think we've absolutely got to break away from this frame of mind. So looking to the future, how should we see uh, our economic fate outside the European Union? Well, there was a, I think he was a great economist called Mankur Olsen, who wrote about uh, what it is that makes some countries can succeed and others not succeed. And one of the things he said was that, you know, if, if there's not a disturbance, a lot of countries' institutions, they ossify, and they end up being a serious problem. And every so often you need a major institutional shake-up and an upset to deal, to sort out the ossification of institutions and practices and norms and culture and so on. And for many countries in Europe, that factor, that shake-up factor, was the Second World War. And for us, not, because of course we won. Um, and so in many ways, we were so much of our system was confirmed rather than shaken up. Mm -hmm. Our shake up, or I think I might say shake up phase one, came a good deal later with Mrs. Thatcher. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in much of my writing and thinking, I, I'm very taken with what's happened in Singapore, which is a country I know quite well. I'm not suggesting that we all emulate everything that goes on in Singapore, but it is a country, I think, to be much admired. Um, and one of the striking things about Singapore, of course, is with its beginning, this, the British leaving, you know, swampy, disease-ridden small island, previously dependent upon Britain, uh, then it's, it's in the Malaysian Federation, and it's sort of edged out, or partly leaves and kicked out of the Malaysian Federation, um, and things seemed really grim. This leaving the Malaysian Federation was the, the rocket factor 
up the institutional structure of Singapore. Now we're on our own. We've just got to do things right. And they did. And the results are plain for all to see. Well, I'm very hopeful that leaving the EU is going to deliver the rocket factor for us. Thank you very, very much. Good.